Welcome to Conversations with Gurmami. This is episode 7. Our guest is Andre Sunday. He's a sports director of Judo Canada and the former national team coach, as well as the current coach for the visually impaired judo team. One of the highlights of his career was winning his first gold medal in the Polish National Judo Championship. Another crucial moment was the last medal he won in the European Championship in 1987. Throughout his career, he's won quite a few medals, including seven in Poland, five in European Championships, and four in the University World Championship. This conversation was held after an early Sunday morning judo conditioning class at the Takahashi Dojo, attended by Priscilla Gagne and Tony Walby as they trained for the 2015 Parapan American Games held in Toronto. I, I read online somewhere that originally your the for, first sport you you started playing was uh, football, soccer. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us uh, tell us about soccer and what you enjoyed about the sport. Um. Well, I was a child, and everybody in uh, in the community and the neighborhood played soccer. Uh, that was the pastime uh, in uh, during the school breaks. That was the pastime after uh, the school was over, and everybody in the neighborhood was playing soccer. Obviously, it was a very exciting exercise, and more than anything, uh, what was exciting about it, it, it was a form of exercise. So you were in constant move and. Uh, uh, in competition with other boys and uh, uh, time away from home was always uh, busy with uh, this kind of activities. But soccer was the first organized uh, sport that I uh, have been part of but for a very short time and uh, however I, I played soccer for the rest of my life and I still enjoy. Oh you uh, still play? Oh, I play when I have a chance. Cool. Know. What position? Yeah. Uh, there is no such thing as uh, position in soccer. You play whatever uh, position you are put in on the field. And uh, when I was uh, playing an organized club as a child, I'll uh, be placed uh, in a defense position on the right side of the fence. Uh, however, I didn't like that much uh, because uh, I had uh, this competitive drive to score goals like probably mm -hmm. most of the boys of that age and uh, it's very difficult to score goals when you are playing in the fence you know you have different tasks to perform and uh, so that was probably one of the uh, main reasons why I didn't last in that sport for much uh, uh, longer because uh, simply it didn't uh, it didn't meet my uh, desire to actually to be the aggressor and uh, and and try to score goals so you you like more individual sports as opposed to group sports? Is it I definitely ended up in individual sport, mm -hmm. although throughout my life uh, and uh, throughout my life, you know, now uh, being almost sixty, you know, the early years of your life, of your conscious life, are are quite far away from you back there. But yeah, uh, all the time of the elementary and high school. And then early times of university, uh, I've been involved in a variety of different team sports like uh, basketball, volleyball and handball, which was very popular, uh, it still is very popular right. in Europe. But uh, those were activities that were school-based and because I was in a given school and given school had a strong team somewhere and uh, people were involved in that particular sport. That's how it worked, you know, that's uh, probably how it works also in today's Canadian school system. When you have a strong uh, tradition in volleyball, then you have a volleyball team. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't have tradition, then you have something else. So, uh, what was, sorry, what was the, the uh, sporting culture in, in Poland uh, at the time? Like in terms of uh, being involved in sports, uh, was that something that was valued? Was 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 it something that was taking? Was there investment? Was it taken serious? What was? What was? Th th describe that for us. Um, well, I I think that um, the value of the sport in a society and in, in any society is pretty much the same. It's. Uh, um, and, and I'm talking about the mass sport, the uh, recreational level sport that pretty much everybody is involved in because it comes through the school system and you go uh, uh, through a school, you have to be involved in physical education and if you have any inclination to do any sport, then you are involved in school sports, teams, etc. So that, uh, from that perspective, is probably similar uh, to, what, uh, uh, to what we have in Canada. Uh, why I'm, I'm addressing this from the perspective of similarities because 
uh, that's where the similarities end. Uh, the uh, uh, culture of sport in Canada is dominated by professional sports, and uh, uh, the media uh, completely dominate is completely dominated uh, by a few sports that take all the time and make sure that uh, that uh, no other sports have access to it. So there is no exposure of of a variety of different uh, uh, sports uh, to the to the general public or the greater public. Uh, while in um, you mean as in exposure to amateur sports? Yes. Right. Yes. That's uh, that's the culture of the land. You know, mm -hmm. we have we have uh, we have hockey here that uh, devours pretty much everything. That's uh, that's my uh, uh, observation of it. Um, and then there is uh, the other big professional sports that uh, that uh, are still uh, accessible on the on the uh, through the media and and, and they, they exist in the mind of of the population. Those are the few other sports that are really uh, high end professional professional activities. The rest is just the marginal uh, cultural activity most of the time. In um, Eastern Europe, uh, in particular, um, in uh, perhaps not uh, not in particular in Poland, but in Eastern Europe, the sports were pretty much equally emphasized. So, there, there, Olympic sports in particular, or, 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 or um, some non-Olympic sports also had access to uh, media exposure. The media exposure obviously wasn't uh, the same uh, kind of. Uh, uh, exposure we know today in Canada, there's you know uh, hundreds of channels, and you can actually choose from um, uh, from them, and you still have the repetitive uh, themes of those professional sports over there. Uh, uh, when I was growing up in Poland, there were two TV channels, both of them nation uh, nationally controlled, and uh, and uh, uh, both of them uh, uh, pretty much uh, showing the same uh, the same content, and mm -hmm. in that particular. Uh, environment, uh, there was probably, I would say, uh, relatively equal exposure to, let's say, 30 different sports, you know, that were relatively popular in, in, in Poland. So, um, uh, that's a lot of sports, though. That's a lot 30, of sports. I mean, absolutely. You know, but, the to but the sports stars, the stars of the sport, of mm -hmm. different sports, if they were really somebody uh, uh, special, at the international scene, those people were as popular as hockey stars in Canada, and they were popular and not just in their own community, they're popular uh, to the general public. So they, mm -hmm. they were famous judoka in Poland, they were famous uh, wrestlers in Poland, they were right. famous uh, weightlifters uh, in Poland. Obviously the, the sport uh, that uh, uh, dominated uh, the public attention over there, it's soccer, and it is still soccer, and it is going to be soccer, because of the accessibility of it, the f huge volume of people who play that sport. Right. And and the culture that that uh, evolved around around soccer in, in uh, probably the rest of the world out outside of North America, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. So, so summarizing my response, yes, the culture was very different. The culture of of uh, uh, sport uh, in uh, Europe in general, but in Eastern Europe in particular at that time uh, was very different from what we know in Canada. When I, I read online, uh, I'm going to be making a lot of reference to, to, to what I read online. Um, but I, I read online you when you first were uh, exposed to the sport of judo, you immediately fell in love with the sport. Yeah. Yes. Can you give us? Can you tell us that story and and uh, be as descriptive as as possible? In other words, you know, talk about the dojo you were in and what <laughs> what it was that that really drew you into that. Uh, from from soccer, actually, it, uh, after soccer, I've I've uh, had a short uh, a short time uh, exposure to gymnastics, and it was uh, again a relatively short time uh, when uh, when I attended this activity at uh, uh, at uh, organized level outside of school, uh, but. Uh, uh, how it worked in Poland in uh, in uh, 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 sports like judo that uh, were uh, at this at that point of time judo in Poland started only in the 60s you know in the 1960s there were first people who started to learn judo from books and then there were two uh, f uh, 
Polish born in France who returned to Poland with uh, black belts in judo and they've introduced judo in much more uh, organized and professional fashion uh, and then there was first Japanese teacher who came to Poland in the 60s and then second one so uh, when I joined judo in the 1971 that was one year before the Olympic Games in Munich this was a very uh, um, oriental uh, uh, looking uh, sport that, that had a lot of esoteric you know uh, esoteric atmosphere around it there was not much knowledge about what it really is and uh, the first generation of teachers obviously they weren't uh, very highly skilled uh, judoka because they didn't learn this sport from uh, from from uh, from the scratch, from the best teachers, they just you know experimented a lot. So when I joined judo, my first uh, coach uh, uh, was actually a gymnast who learned judo. He was only a blue belt, and he was coaching 120 boys uh, uh, who were kind of drafted into into a class mm -hmm. because that's how it worked. Uh, uh, five of my school friends who uh, were not my best uh, uh, friends, they were actually bullies who bullied me all the time because uh, this was natural uh, behavior, by the way, in, in, in the schools at that point of time and uh, in, in Poland, that uh, this wasn't something that was uh, in any way, shape or form um, discouraged. It was th uh, uh, yeah. It was natural. It okay. was natural. So uh, un unless uh, or until something really uh, serious happened, like somebody was really uh, hurt, uh, being bullied by some bigger guy or or, or group of guys, uh, nobody really paid attention to it, and that was that was a natural behavior again. You know, during the. Uh, uh, periods between the classes, etc. This was a r natural behavior that some uh, boys uh, sought uh, uh, other boys and and, on, and and tried to try to hurt them. So I had few of uh, such friends in in my school, and they 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 were a group from one neighborhood, and they always uh, you know tried to intimidate uh, boys from different neighborhoods. And I was kind of uh, you know uh, by myself, but uh, standing up to them and and uh, holding my ground. But they joined a uh, um, school judo program and they uh, were bragging about it and uh, that was one of the satellites uh, school judo programs that were run uh, by one club in my town. My, my hometown, uh, Bydgoszcz, was uh, 400,000 people strong and it was ju one judo club run by the police forces in, in town. So it was... There, there was only one, uh, one, one dojo for 400,000... Uh, Absolutely. Wow, yes. okay. And uh, the way they worked, uh, uh, it, they, they, uh, at the beginning of the school year in September, they, they called, uh, uh, they, they've chosen a number of schools in the, in the region, as many instructors as they could manage. They had those instructors sent to those schools, and uh, they kind of made a selection of the boys whom they felt who were suitable for judo. And that meant, most of the time, those who were most aggressive strongest the biggest and uh, and those who like to fight you know that was the reality and uh, they've based on the size of the of the school program etc they've they allow sometimes 20 sometimes 30 uh, boys into a program and that's how those five bullies from my uh, my class my school uh, uh, um, started judo and when they started judo they you know they bragged about it a lot and then you know uh, uh, and they um, uh, they were sure that now they are going to dominate everybody, etc. And I had a, uh, a high school, uh, I, I, that, not that time high school yet, uh, I had a, uh, at that time very, very good physical education teacher and one, one uh, day during the class he said, uh, you are pr doing judo and I bet that Andrzej, uh, you know, can beat you all. You know? So he put on uh, mats on the uh, wrestling mats, which were part of every gym right. uh, in 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 Poland, and asked me to uh, to wrestle those guys. You know? Wow! And I wrestled them one after another in front of everyone. Yeah, of course. So he put you on the spot, like he he, he put you on the spot. Yeah, as he in put me on the spot. Uh, but he how did you react to that? What were you the initial reaction? The you? initial that there was no initial reaction. In, in the school, you either did what you were told to do, or or you you weren't part of the system. Mm. You know that was, 
the system of education in, in, in Eastern Europe was very, very different from what we know in Canada. The, the, the idea is, was not to uh, develop um, uh, individuals who are self uh, conscious of confident and perfect, etc. And uh, uh, the idea was not to uh, develop people uh, based on uh, positive reinforcement. The idea was negative reinforcement. So you were never good enough. Wow. Whatever you did was, you should always try to do better. And uh, you, you, you didn't have teachers who would tap you sh on the shoulder because you did relatively good and tell you, oh, you're fantastic. Well, that's that's garbage, that's garbage, that's garbage, you should work harder, etc. And it was always the same. That was the elementary, high school uh, uh, environment that uh, that the society grew in. So, But, uh, you know, uh, sorry to interrupt, this is really interesting because what you're describing uh, to me sounds like it's that's very common everywhere else in the world, uh, as w outside of uh, maybe Eastern Europe. That's, you know what I mean? That's not exclusive... To Eastern Europe? No, I don't think so, because I mean, I, I know from, from people who come, I'm originally from East Africa, and, and that's very... Common. Yeah, yeah you know, and, and from, from other cultures, I mean, I don't want to generalize here, but hearing that is, uh, it seems like a very... Familiar. Yeah, and very realistic uh, approach to way life. of measuring things, you yeah. know, to say, hey, you know what, that's mediocre. You can do, but, you know, uh, anyways, please. Uh, well, yeah, I, 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 I think so. I, th I think that you are absolutely uh, on the money with that statement. I, I know that North American society is pretty proud of the fact that we are very different. And uh, I, I hear often statements being in a world of sports and leading w and, and dealing with people who are trying to find better ways to do better things. And that is a constant search for excellence. And we try to do things better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And uh, the positive reinforcement, the positive thinking, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, there, there, there is a lot of uh, this kind of um, uh, theories that, yes, this is the only way to go. But there are also other theories that say, no, that's not necessarily true. The, 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 there is a lot of re resurgence of, of, of value being placed on people who are actually not uh, uh, thinking in a positive fashion because those people are needed in a society in order to bring the reality back into the picture. Mm -hmm. If we are going to live in, in the world of dreams all the time, then eventually that, that's going to catch on and we are sure. not going to be able to, you know, to face real challenges. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the real challenges, challenges are here and we have to face those. And that's... Uh, uh, that's my opinion, that's my personal point of view, and that applies to my personal life, that applies to my professional life, to judo, and, and uh, you know, tapping, tapping athletes on the back all the time and telling them that, yes, you are fantastic, etc., you know, leads to uh, people who, when they r face the real world and they face the real challenge of really strong people f from different parts of the world who are training twice or three or five times as much as, as our athletes sometimes, and then suddenly hitting the wall, and until until that moment you were told that you were fantastic and great, etc., all the time. And then you realize that something must have uh, went wrong because I cannot deal with this kind of people here who are, you know, just stronger. That was my experience when I started to work with uh, uh, with the Kenyan national team. They they didn't take any kind of um, realistic approach to what is happening and what they need to do, uh, uh, not just they didn't take it seriously, they, they couldn't cope with that reality. When you, when, you, when you made a true statement about their capacities, today's capacities, and what they need to do in order to get from here to there, um, many people just simply couldn't take it. They, they quit. Or they, they called you, you know, who the F are you? Are you a god to tell me that I can't do something? I said, no, I'm not a god. I'm just looking at the realistic picture. If you are working uh, five hours a week or ten hours a week and you are facing a few hundred people uh, from, from 150 countries, each of them works 25 to 30 hours per week. So you are doing 20% of their work and you are expecting to, to be competitive with them. It just does not adapt. You know, that, mm -hmm. That's the reality. Uh, so, but before we dive into that, uh, this is really interesting. I, I want to go back to that moment when, when your uh, physical education coach uh, on the spot said, you fight, 
you you wrestle these guys now. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about uh, how you did in in, in that first? I, I beat them, I, beat them. and uh, there were. Uh, so were you were the bully now. <laughs> not really. Kidding, kidding. Uh, you know, being a bully is a matter I'm of your psychology. No, the reality is that uh, uh, yes, I, I I beat them on the mat, everybody, and five in a row, and uh, with not much of um, of an effort. There was not 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 uh, clear. Uh, the, the, I had a clear advantage over those those guys, and I didn't realize that before. Uh, but uh, I was just stronger. I was stronger, and uh, the, the, there were two guys who were really the leaders of the bullies, and one of them was much, much bigger than me. And uh, uh, on top of that, uh, the teacher said, "You know, arm wrestling," and I beat the, in arm wrestling as well. You know? mm. And I was smaller, much smaller than those guys. At that point of time, I, I was a late bloomer, and I grew up when I was 16, 17, that was my growth spurt. When, uh, those guys, uh, they were 13, 14, and they already had, uh, uh, most of them went through, uh, you know, the s typical symptoms of, of maturation when I was far behind. Anyway, it's um, it, it was uh, surprising to me, it was surprising even to my teacher that it went so well. Uh, but uh, he recognized probably that you know I had some natural abilities. We had a lot of um, uh, school activities that were multi-sport oriented, and there was uh, uh, um, uh, throughout the elementary school system there was actually school uh, and national championships on an annual basis, uh, which obviously involved thousands of schools uh, across Poland. But uh, uh, there was a team competition and there was a variety of different uh, exercises that uh, the team had to perform. And it was always competition, you know, school against school, eliminated school, and it was ladder system and the, the best school was always uh, uh, you know, it was exposed, it was on national TV, and, uh, you know, it was a very, very valuable physical education activity. But involved, that activity involved a variety of different movements, variety, it was running backwards, forwards, flipping, uh, you know, going through tunnels, walking up the f walls, etc. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and 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 running with balls, throwing balls, basketballs, handballs, uh, you know, ev everything you can imagine. From mm. year to year, there was different set of activities and different relays developed, and school pr schools prepared. And I always was on the school team, you know. And the school team was were not school teams were not very large, you know. There was, I, if I remember correctly, perhaps ten to twelve boys and the same number of girls on the team. And uh, so th that was the school team, and the, the, the school team was selected by the teachers uh, uh, from from the entire school population, which uh, in my case was over well over 1,500 kids in, in elementary school mm -hmm. where I was in. Also, one more difference in the system of education in, in, in Eastern Europe and, and Canada was that uh, once you went to school, the grade one, you stayed with the same group of people until you finished elementary school, which was grade eight. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just, you started usually with uh, with uh, 30 people per, per classroom. And uh, the first uh, four years uh, was with class uh, a classroom teacher who was uh, pretty much delivering the entire program. And from grade five to eight, which was the end of the elementary school, uh, it changed. You stayed with the same class, but every subject was delivered by a by a professional in that particular subject. So math was done by somebody with mathematics degree, mm -hmm. uh, physics, etc., etc. And physical education was done by physical education teacher who actually understood what physical education is mm -hmm. and delivered a program that uh, that actually uh, resulted in some kind of. Uh, um, Physi physical effects and physiological effects. You know. It wasn't that let's go play soccer and you know let's go play this. No, it was physical. Very organized. Uh, yes. Very, very uh, systematic. systemic. Right. Yeah. So, on that note. And then I joined the judo club. You know, okay. and uh, uh, the judo club uh, uh, had. Um, and I didn't go through the through the school uh, s uh, system, which was, if I remember correctly, five or six satellite uh, smaller smaller programs. Uh, because of that uh, performance, I was uh, invited to a judo club, and I started uh, a regular judo training, which was at that time three times per week, plus physical preparation training. And I was at that time 12 years old, so 
the training started from the very beginning with 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 you know very high intensity and uh, purpose. The purpose was to compete and to win. There was there was no other no other reason for for judo training. And the uh, training was delivered. Um, uh, you know, I had to I had I had to take a bus uh, after school. I came from from uh, school. I you know I loved it. I uh, you know I realized that this is something that gave me uh, an outlet for everything I wanted. You know, I, I found friends in that environment uh, very very quickly, and I wasn't uh, that uh, I wasn't the best by by any means in that in that program for the first uh, many years. There were there were kids who had uh, been involved in judo for. Uh, two or three years earlier than me. Uh, so when I was 12 years old, there were people who started judo at the age of 9, 10. Most of the people who were in those through, who went through those school programs. So when I joined the club, I realized that you know there is uh, a lot of very strong boys around. You know, it's not uh, the the bullies from my school were not the strongest and right, <laughs> not right. the biggest. You know, sure. when you f- find yourself suddenly f- in a completely different. Uh, uh, pond size, you mm-hmm. know, and you have fishes that f- you have fish there that uh, that uh, can eat the, mm-hmm. the the fish that until now was your main enemy. But those five boys from my class also joined the the program. The the, the program when when uh, when I joined it was 120 boys strong, mm-hmm. and uh, the job of the coach was pretty much to make sure that after one year uh, you have only those left who really are dedicated and who have the who who show the commitment and and have the potential to continue, and that's indeed what happened. You know, the, the dropout rate was very high, and the training was uh, hard from the very beginning and very harsh environment because it was mostly uh, we we learned techniques and uh, as good as we could have learned techniques from people. You know, I, I can you know I can I could can now talk about it because you know after forty. Uh, 40 years almost in judo, you know, I, I understand what it means to understand judo uh, to a certain degree. But uh, the coach, as I said, that that was delivered that program was a blue belt uh, gymnast. So he had very rud- rudimentary understanding of, of what judo is and he could perform techniques because he was adult man and strong. And uh, he could just lift somebody in one arm and throw them without understanding what what needs to happen in order to do it when you have the same strength, the same size, etc. So the learning of techniques was not really uh, something that uh, uh, that was delivered at at any level that that would be acceptable in Canadian dojo today. You know, the, and the, the, there was no understanding of it. It was just pure strength and. Just do it, you know, mm-hmm. a little bit of demonstration and then randori mostly. Wow. And uh, f- in that environment, obviously, many boys uh, uh, quit quite quickly. And uh, they, and then those who didn't quit and uh, there was no more spot because the system worked in such a way that this coach, after a year or sometimes two years, uh, delivered the boys he brought up through the first stage to another coach who was responsible for all their age group. So because we were in the age group until um, until 15, I remember, or un- until 14 years old, so we were all lumped together, the 100 plus boys, and uh, training together hard. And then two years later, I, uh, I I was moved to a group to much much more advanced uh, uh, coach who was actually a very uh, good technical coach uh, for uh, again i didn't know that at that time but uh, after many years later uh, of reflection of what happened in my life you know i've realized that this was a really really um, uh, a gentleman ahead of his time in terms of understanding judo and he was second dan at that time and uh, he was relatively young and he was still competing at the senior level in poland he wasn't very successful at that but uh, he was a competitor and um, and he was, uh, you know, I, I grew up to be almost as big as him because he was 60 kilogram fighter or 63 kilogram fighter at that time. And uh, when I was 15, 16, I started to actually mature, and uh, and I was as big as him. And I remember having battles with this coach, you know, every every training session. He liked to to, to do randori with me, and uh, I liked to do randori with him. And uh, you know, when I have now Ben coming after me mm-hmm. uh, in the dojo, uh, 
uh, it sometimes reminds me of that mind, you know, I said, except, you know, I'm almost 60 and that coach was still competing at the senior level. He was uh, 20, in the middle 20. So it's, it's uh, he was at, at full um, uh, strength and uh, we were going after him. It's not just me, but there were a few other boys that, uh, that, uh, that we did a lot of randori with, with this coach and a lot of our judo. My judo, at least, I, when I when I see how I understand it and how I do things now, uh, I can trace back to that second coach of mine. Who can you tell? You mentioned that he was ahead of his time, right? Can you elaborate as to why you think he was uh, ahead of his time? Is it is it a comparative between your first original coach? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. And also the coaches whom I later on met, because I've moved eventually from my environment, from my hometown to a stronger judo environment, the strongest uh, uh, possible at that time, but uh, that was m quite a few years later. Mm -hmm. It wasn't many years later because it only looks many years when you are 20 and three years back looks very long time ago. But mm -hmm. the fact is that, uh, you know, between between 15 and 20, at, at age of 20, I moved out of my hometown, but uh, uh, that, that at that time it was a very, very long time. And I've uh, kind of... Uh, at uh, that point of time, still didn't reflect on the ability of, of that individual coach. Uh, his understanding of judo, you know, the first time I've experienced something was uh, the, the the coach, my first coach, he was preparing for his Shodan exam. And uh, because I was one of his favorite students, he chose me to be his uke. And uh, he was learning kata. And he was doing nageno kata, obviously, and I was his uke, and you know, and uh, he was trying extremely hard. So I, w I, I used to stay after my session in my in my dojo, and uh, uh, we started classes by the way at five o'clock, and the session ended up six thirty or seven o'clock, and at seven o'clock the next class, the junior class started, which was the boys over fifteen to twenty. And then after that class, there was a senior class mm. that, that was uh, happening f late in the evening. So uh, this uh, uh, first coach of mine used me as Hizuke for the uh, for the Nagenokata, and uh, I remember this being one of the most painful experiences because he really did everything with strength, and he was throwing so powerfully. And the mats weren't the quality we have here. It was much more rudimentary equipment. So it was a hard break falls, and uh, uh, lots of it. And then during that uh, uh, second class, I've observed the other coach, you know, who was a black belt at that time, and he did a lot of technical stuff with his athletes. And then one day, uh, 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 during that Nagenokata experience, uh, my my coach uh, uh, asked uh, the other coach to actually show him something. And uh, the other coach was much smaller in stature, you know, than my my coach. Um, uh, came and took me as as Hizuke and he demonstrated the same techniques, and I, for the first time in my life, felt like I'm being thrown without effort, and wow. I and I fell and I did it hurt, you know. It, it didn't hurt. It didn't, mm. because it was done the right way. Sure. And uh, so that was the first uh, awakening that yeah, you can do it in a completely different way, and that's obviously the way it should have been done mm -hmm. from the very beginning. But uh, you don't analyze things like that when you are 12, 13, 14, 15, you know. It mm -hmm. comes much, much later in life when, when we actually have the capacity to, to reflect on things like that. At least I didn't have the capacity at age 15. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I moved to the second group. I had fantastic experience with, uh, with my second coach and, and uh, I stayed with him probably for three or four years. And then I moved to the senior to the senior group in my club, and shortly after I moved to the senior group, I I, I moved out of town, uh, which was uh, uh, which was uh, not just uh, uh, resulting from my judo uh, career, but also from my personal life. And uh, you know, I was very young. I met a woman of my life uh, who was a widow with uh, with two kids, and I decided that. Uh, uh, I will be the father of those kids and mm -hmm. uh, her husband, uh, which uh, wasn't well received by my parents. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they were in such an opposition to this uh, development that um, 
I've uh, had no option but to move and uh, and uh, moved to a completely different town, different environment. But Sorry, because your parents were, were not uh, were not supportive the, of, of that. Yes, absolutely. Ah, wow. Yeah, wow. and because uh, uh, judo was at that point of time uh, somewhat professional sport in Poland, uh, there was a professional uh, a league uh, for for senior athletes, definitely that uh, who represented variety of different army clubs and mm -hmm. police clubs and also some universities uh, had uh, had professional uh, or let's say. Uh, they weren't called professionals because we didn't make money, mm -hmm. but uh, th there were a lot of privileges for two people who were uh, who were uh, representing those clubs, uh, police officers, uh, wh which, by the way, still exist. This is exactly how it works in uh, most of the Western European societies. Uh, the, the system came from uh, from West Germany, from France, uh, and and Italy, and 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 Spain. So Eastern Europe wasn't the inventor of that kind of support for athletes. And it still exists ag again uh, today, uh, as I say, um, in, in, in most of the strong judo nations in Western European uh, countries, that's precisely how it works. So when you become a member of a, a, a judo club, recruited by the judo club because of your quality as an athlete, and you will represent their club in their team competition, national, national championships, then you are a police officer who is whose job actually until the end of his career is to compete so they they have full time uh, capacity to to uh, to work uh, and and train mm -hmm. f with uh, uh, some variations of this setup you know some some uh, clubs required some time of part time work from those uh, uh, who were involved as athletes it also depended a lot on your quality if you were you know the the top of the line the and the the, the national team member then that didn't apply to you but uh, many um, many colleagues uh, from your team and and again i'm still saying boys and colleagues etc uh, in, in my time there were no females in judo in mm -hmm. poland mm -hmm. uh, actually um, uh, it started uh, in the in the 80s when um, uh, women judo uh, started to actually compete internationally. The first world championships was in 1980, and uh, until it uh, became an Olympic sport, no one in Poland paid attention to it or took uh, took it seriously. Once it became Olympic sport, it became a high-profile, uh, you know, activity, and from that moment on, it took off quite rapidly and and uh, evolved in a similar fashion to, to the male uh, system. Uh, so, yeah, it's... So, uh, once you moved, you moved out of your town. Uh, t t talk to us about your, at the age of 20, talk to, about uh, your transition uh, competing at, at the higher level, because you did represent your, your, your country. Right. Yes, well, but at, uh, at that time I already f I, I was a member of the national team. Uh, I was um, I won national championships, the junior national championships, at the age of nineteen, and that was actually my first national championships I competed at, because uh, the ideology of, of of the coaches and uh, and the system were was such that uh, uh, you do not compete in competition to which you are not ready for, and they didn't believe that I'm ready at the age of 17, 18 to compete at the junior level because it was until the age of 21. That was the so at the age of 19. That was the first time I was actually invited to compete at the national championships level, and I won this uh, first uh, first competition I went to. Uh, somewhat unexpectedly, because I had to beat in my uh, on my way to the podium actually four uh, four guys who were all very uh, experienced and titled, uh, you know, national team members. And uh, the fifth one in uh, in the final was actually my club colleague, uh, who who was a very very strong judoka, and um, uh, whom I used to lose uh, for years over and over again. And I beat him first time. In the final of the national championship, so it was where kind of, it matters. Yeah, well, it, 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 to me, it it was when it matters, but uh, at the same time, it was um, he started judo much earlier, and right. he had this advantage over me. And uh, uh, over the years, it was instilled in me that I cannot beat him. 
mm. but you know and uh, and he was a national team member at a much earlier uh, uh, moment of, of his life than, than I ever was and I kind of was jealous of it because you know what uh, for 17 uh, 16 17 years old people it meant a lot if uh, you went with the national team abroad to represent Poland and uh, I didn't have that chance you know but at the same time I had the chance to stay at school because once you became a national team member uh, the life changed you know there there were regulations in Poland signed by the minister of uh, uh, of uh, education uh, minister of education mm. that everybody who is invited to national team camp is excused from school mm. and national team camps for national junior team members were four or five months a year uh, which included the two summer months, but also it included three months of the regular school year. School year. And then many of those uh, early bloomers who went to, through this kind of lifestyle for two, three years in their high school time, uh, had hard, hard time to actually finish the high school and uh, to do well enough to actually uh, give them some kind of opportunity in life. And, and in my case, I didn't go to any national training camps until I was 18. Uh, the first camp, I was 18. I went to national training camp in the summertime only. And at the 19, I won, t I won the national championships. And then my real, uh, 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 my real uh, encounter with the high-performance judo started because, uh, yeah, it is a completely different environment when you train with the same group of people at home and you know those people uh, for years. You train with them and so you, you know them you know their strengths. You, know oh, their, you, you, know, you you anticipate every move they make, mm. um, and then you finally si find yourself among uh, the adult men, strong, real men population that is involved in the sport for for much longer than you are, and they are mature. They are uh, they are uh, <laughs> they are the best in the country, and and you have fifty of them on the mat, and. Uh, how was that? How was that the transition in, in, in that? Uh... I was, uh, um, uh, you know, I remember it being painful, but at the same time, un unbelievably enjoyable mm. because it was a fantastic group of people. You know, there, there were people who were not really uh, motivated to do uh, something else, some, somewhere else, you know, that they, they were living relatively comfortable life, doing what they like. You know, which was judo, right. but uh, there were some people who were motivated to be the best in the world, and they were working extremely, extremely hard, and they were uh, they were the inspiration to to those young people joining the team for the first time, the second, third time, and they they were, they were actually the driving forces, and that is that is true in any environment. You know, you have to have some drivers uh, that that are going to inspire the rest. And then there is the group of people who are there because they are needed, because it's a combat sport. You need sparring partners, sure. and you need th those sparring partners to be as strong as possible. And they, in training, they are. You know, they are perhaps not motivated to do as well, or they cannot do as well in the international competition because they don't either commit themselves to it, or they this is not their main priority, or this is something that. Uh, that uh, they they don't handle mentally very well, you know. That's mm. most of the uh, time is the reason. But um, physically, everybody was prepared, and that was uh, that was you know uh, a very very different environment, awakening for me. But at the same time, um, it came relatively easy to me. I was still very young, you know, and and I was healthy, and uh, it uh, it went well. Could you elaborate on when you say uh, training hard? that some of these members uh, were training really hard. Can you elaborate as to what that means? Uh, give, give us a description of... of uh, well, judo is very difficult to describe, you know, in terms of quantity, volume, uh, uh, or intensity, or... or, uh, or um, because you cannot measure it. You cannot measure it with time, you cannot measure it with load, you cannot measure it with distance, etc. It's just... Uh, is just person against person, you know, and uh, uh, from this perspective, it's uh, uh, very difficult to evaluate w who is actually working hard, who is not. When you, when you, unless you are in it, unless okay. you are in it, 
and uh, uh, because from the, for the outsiders, for those who are looking from the outside and don't understand what is actually happening there, mm-hmm. uh, this may not look that hard. But when you really actually start evaluating what is happening to physiologic, to physiologically to the people who participate in the sport, you actually realize that this is one of the hardest sports on the planet, if not the hardest. Actually, in Eastern European sport theory and methodology, this was described as the hardest sport. Judo. Yes. More so than wrestling. More so than wrestling. More so than any other fo- uh, contact Gymnastics. sport. Gymnastics. Oh, by far. Really? Yeah. There is no, There is no comparison. Absolutely. And the reason for it uh, is judo uh, uh, physiologically involves much greater level of physiological activity in in the, in the body than any other sport because of the number of uh, of uh, impact that that the, that your body takes. Um, you talk to people who are involved uh, in judo today, but were involved in other sports, or who are involved in both sports at the same time, like hockey, for example, in judo, or American football in judo. You know, we had uh, uh, contact with American football players and playing at the N- uh, NFL. NFL level. Mm-hmm. Uh, two of them were trying for the Olympic team in in uh, Atlanta in 1996 in heavyweight. Okay. And uh, Joe Felton, one of them, the other one I don't remember. But, you know, when, when uh, they were interviewed and they said there is no comparison in terms of hard, harshness of the training between football and judo. But football is much easier on the body. And so is hockey. You talk to people who are practicing hockey and they tell you exactly the same. And wrestling is different because you don't take so many breakfalls. You don't take body slams like in judo. Mm-hmm. You know, in judo mm-hmm. you take 50, 60, 70, sometimes hundreds a day. And in wrestling, it's not possible. The wrestling also has completely different dynamics because you do not have a judo gi. Um, you um, have the capacity to keep your body relaxed and uh, until you are in clinched position. Mm-hmm. And uh, the action is much more dynamic and uh, uh, usually much shorter than judo. Judo, because of the harness that is the judo gi, and you can grab somebody and, ho- and hold, you have much more isometric contraction involved in that in that exercise if you are not able to relax your body when you are in a clinched position then after 45 seconds on isometric contraction you are completely exhausted you have no capacity to perform powerful movement fast movement etc and it's like uh, isometric gymnastic exercise that is let's say the 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 iron rings you know you And you, you, uh, it's it's a short exercise because in that kind of isometric contraction effort, you, your body cannot handle it for longer than 30, 45 seconds. And in judo, you sometimes are in this kind of situation because of no other option. That's the only way you can survive because somebody grabbed you and pulls you in and bends you over. And in order to stay on your feet, you have to hold your body in, in that kind of a contraction and then you relax, you have 10-15 seconds off and then you go again, then you take breakfalls, you know, in training it's a variety of different methodologies of course, but uh, yeah, it is uh, definitely one of the harshest sports and, and, and I'm talking in terms of um, what it takes to become a high end competitor, because obviously when you are doing judo at the recreational level, um, it can be delivered in a very different way. You don't have to take this many breakfasts. You are not f- competing against very strong people, f- and uh, and uh, and still, uh, I- you you are involved in judo. You know how it how your body feels after 30 minutes of randorina waza. If you are not ready for it, you hurt. You hurt mm-hmm. all over, and it it hurts uh, uh, very similarly to what uh, what a very hard uh, uh, weight training can do. To you when you are not ready for it you go for very harsh exercise uh, in, in, a, in a gym and uh, your body is full of pain for the next two three days and judo is the same you know except even if you are in good shape you, you feel that pain I'm gonna we're winding down here I don't want to take um, more of your time I really appreciate you know yeah. your your uh, you talking and, and sharing all this info I want to fast forward and, and jump and, and ask about uh, the state of judo in, in Canada from, from your point of view. Uh, generally speaking, what is the state of, of judo in Canada? Actually, before that, give us a comparative. Uh, when, when you first came to Canada as, as, as a judoka, what was your impression of 
uh, judo in this country? Um, surprising, uh, surprisingly, uh, I, I felt it was, uh, I was very surprised at the low capacity uh, of competitors. And uh, and the reason why I was I was surprised, uh, I knew uh, from my competitive time when I was traveling with the national team of uh, Poland, that was, let's say, between the uh, uh, between the 80 uh, uh, to 88, uh, the team, the Canadian team uh, on the international scene was very strong. That's one of the teams that was uh, uh, to be reckoned with, you know, when, when you competed against Canadians. There was still the, it was one generation of athletes, and those were the people who grew up uh, together. And uh, you know, Phil Takahashi was one of those. Kevin Doherty was one of those. Kevin was actually a, my uh, my rival in my category, and uh, James Kendrick was one of those people. Uh, uh, Mark uh, Berger and we had a very good relationship actually with the Canadians, uh, mostly because of Mark Berger, who was an Im immigrant from from uh, from Ukraine. And uh, uh, because of uh, our capacity to communicate with him, he spoke Russian, we all sp spoke Russian, and uh, uh, we had uh, a good relationship with Canadians. Louis Jani was part of that team. You know? mm. So it's, qu it's quite a connection with Takahashi Dojo, actually. But those were very strong international level players, uh, world-class fighters. And then you come to Canada and you see that there is uh, a, an, an incre incredible gap you know, between those top players and the rest. You know, you go to, I went to a variety of different dojos. The first two years when, when I arrived to Canada, I, I didn't really think that I'll ever work in judo. You know, I, I had to, to support my family and uh, a, a reali realization that judo here is very, very um, amateurish and there is no such thing as professionalism and etc. Uh, uh, it was, was uh, it was obvious to me that I have to do different things in life, you know, but uh, I still went to dojos uh, around Toronto. I, I, I lived in Toronto for the first uh, five years of uh, of my immigration. So I went to to those different clubs and uh, some of them uh, con were considered a recreational clubs. Some of them were considered um, were considered uh, top end uh, competitive clubs. Uh, I was, you know, I, I, I I was already over 30, 32, 33, and uh, relatively unhealthy, I mean, with number of injuries. Sure. And, and I really haven't had a, uh, I, I, haven't, I, I haven't found a challenger there in, mm. in, in years, you know. It was not, not, uh, not even close to the level of, of judo in, in, in Europe. And um, so it, it wasn't uh, a disappointment, it was actually I, an Eye opener, because at the same time, uh, I understood that there is a completely different culture of judo in Canada. You know, there is there is completely different interests, and because there is no such thing as a professional outlet for judoka, many people who actually have lots of potential at the age of 18, 19, 20, they decide not to continue because there is nothing for them later on. Mm. And uh, we are uh, dropping athletes left and right every year that exactly at that stage of their life that are choosing to uh, the careers over the potential career in judo, uh, which from the perspective of judo is uh, unfortunate, but uh, from the perspective of uh, real life and, you know, what Canada is, what the culture of the country is, that's the right choice, I believe, you know. If we, can, we, can, we can say... Um, no, uh, you know, you should stay and continue in judo, but uh, people are smart enough to understand that there is nothing for them except uh, pain, sweat, uh, injury, and lots of money invested, and perhaps f for uh, for no, no success, because the uh, level of international competition is huge. You know, it's and, and right now, as I say, that the, uh, there is 200 countries in the International Judo Federation. There is approximately 135, 45 countries that compete at the world stage, at the world championships. So that is, uh, from the perspective of, of depth of sport, it's if, if not the second or third sport in the in the world in terms of depth, it's very close to that. And um, and we are competing against. 35, 40 countries that actually have a professional judo programs, which we don't have in Canada. That means if we have a Canadian who actually fights at the world stage and wins medals at the world championships and Olympic Games, 
those are absolute events and exceptional athletes who are who are beating up uh, 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 odds that are very very much against them. So having somebody like Nicolas Gill, who was an unbelievable talent, or having now somebody like Antoine Valois Fortier, is um, is a great great accomplishment for Canada. And uh, um, where are we today? We are. You know, one of the sports uh, that uh, that uh, is recognized by Podium Canada, which is the on the podium, the, the the driving force behind development of excellence in sports in Canada. And uh, they uh, they recognize judo as one of the sports with the potential. So we are we are uh, um, we are getting additional uh, support, financial support from this this organization, so we can actually afford to have our athletes to compete at the international stage and, and, and being present at 15 to 20 tournaments a year, which costs a lot of money. And um, without that, there is no no such thing as uh, a chance to compete at international level in, at the senior stage. What it takes is, um, which again, uh, comes today as a reflection, you know, after so many years being involved in judo, uh, to be uh, to be high level international level player you have to you have to be uh, 100% dedicated to the to the sport and that means uh, you have to love the sport that's number 1 and you have to love it uh, when you are 24 25 26 when the optimal years of your of your potential are coming around because there is a lot of uh, people who love judo at the age of 16 17 15 you know uh, there's, you know, infatuation with the sport. It's natural uh, for many people. And then, uh, again, many of those people stop loving judo once they don't experience the success they're expecting to, 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 to experience, or they cannot afford it, uh, which is very common th a theme, uh, or they just uh, have enough of uh, small nagging injuries, etc., and they cannot handle it anymore. So it's... Um, Today's judo in Canada, we are, you know, we have one of the most beautiful national training centers in the world, and that was opened only last year. That is, uh, that has been built by the government of Canada in the uh, premises of the Olympic Stadium in, in Montreal, and it's really uh, an exceptionally uh, fantastic facility with fantastic support of professional staff, and it's not just judoka. It's not just the best judo coaches uh, in the world that we have hired over the past three, four years, uh, and in particular in the past two years. Uh, uh, by the way, my very good friend from Poland is uh, one of the new uh, coaches who was hired by uh, by Judo Canada. And um, from this perspective, we are, uh, let's say, uh, not at the leading edge, but almost there. Uh, from the perspective of support to the number of artists that we can support, you know, the, the ideal situation would be if we have 50, 60 people on the mat every day, or even more, you know, and those people would have motivation other than um, you have to be here because this is your provincial association's uh, priority, you know, and uh, you have to pay for everything, and it costs to get there, it costs for parking, for parents, etc., and it's uh, twice as far as their clubs, or five times as far as their clubs, where they started judo. So there is a motivation that is uh, imposed by uh, policies and regulations, as opposed to by internal motivation from those for, for those people to actually be in this place, because that's the best place to be and train. We always had that place, that was always Montreal, but that was informal, that was an uh, uh, individual club uh, that Mr. Hiroshi Nakamura opened uh, 40 years ago, and uh, it continues until today, and it was over the first 40 years of Kenyan Judo, the informal and formal back and forth national training center. And those athletes who actually succeeded in, in the past 40 years, uh, uh, Kenyan Judoka who succeeded are from that environment. That was the only club in Canada that offered high enough quality of uh, of training. Because you now we're talking a lot about quality of coaching. Quality of coaching, in my opinion, is secondary to the quality of, of training partners. You know, you can have the best coach in the world. If you don't have quality partners, you are no, going nowhere in judo. Hmm. So we have fantastic facility. We have good enough uh, 
group of people training together and uh, I'm, I'm very hopeful that this is going to produce a consistent repeated result at the world stage because that's the only stage that actually matters to our sponsors. We have tons of judoka who are performing very well at the World Cup level, of, uh, Grand Prix level, etc. So tons, I, I mean, by saying that we have uh, uh, probably 20 people who are uh, who are right now placing at uh, v various level, high international uh, world, world stage. Uh, over the past three years, we actually have experienced an um, unbelievable surge of young people coming through the system. Uh, just to say, uh, from the historical perspective, you know, Canada, uh, Canada had probably, if I remember correctly, four medals in the Junior World Championships over the first 40 years of, of uh, Junior World Championships, or the first 30 years. And I can remember all of those guys because I've, I trained all of them as a coach. Uh, mm. uh, it was Pascal Mainville who won a medal in uh, 1989 and Nicolas Gill who won a medal in Junior Worlds in 92 and Luz Bayajon, Amy Tasaka. I was with those athletes in, in the, in, during that time. Those were individuals though and the World Championships happened every two years and to get uh, success at that level was a fantastic performance, you know, fantastic performance because because uh, it was so difficult to place at the World Championships in junior age. And then from 96 until two years ago, we haven't had one medal. It, uh, it was, uh, you know, almost 20 years without medal in the Junior World Championships. And we sent teams every single time. However, in the past uh, uh, two years, now the World Championships are happening every year, and uh, in the past two years, uh, we have had two cadet world champions, one junior world champion, two silver medals in the world championships junior, and two bronze medals, plus number of athletes in the fifth place and number of athletes in the seventh place, which actually shows a very dramatic surge of performance capacity of Canada at this stage of development, which is the young athletes still. We hold What's triggered that? What, what what do you think? What uh well, we have we have a system in place. We've uh, you know this is this is um, I've I've you know I give I give a huge credit to myself. I don't brag about it often, but when I left the the coaching position uh, for, with Judo Canada and then I came back to Judo Canada sport as a sport director, I my coaching experience, the six years of of coaching the Canadian team. Uh, uh, resulted in reflection that that you know the, the, there is a systemic change needed in Canada, not uh, uh, not a coaching change, not a co no, co no, no coach is going to make a difference in this system. So the systemic change was introduction of variety of standards. Uh, 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 that that was standards of uh, uh, establishment of so-called development ladder. That uh, that actually dictates via policy to athletes what their stage of development is based on their performance. So there is no mistake that somebody who performs at uh, regional level in in Saskatchewan, Canada, is capable of going to the World Championships because they are not. There is several steps that are each of of a very significant magnitude that that uh, has to be taken in between this competition and that. And that generates at least um, some understanding in the in the big pond of Canada what kind of uh, capacity you have when you are performing at this level and this and this because there are still um, dodges that are relatively remote in Canada and they don't have uh, much contact with the outside world mm. and in those dodges there are champions. You know, and uh, champion mean, regional champions. Oh well, yeah, okay. they, th those champions. If they don't get exposed to into much bigger ponds, you know, they are champions. Uh, they are some of them are heroes in their communities. You know, their local small press and small town uh, generates such a hype around certain performances that the, the, they become, you know, not, uh, regional legends. And but you know, it's a huge country, and it's very difficult to. Uh, to challenge uh, people from Yukon uh, by people from New Brunswick. There is only one stage as a national championships once a year. So people are meeting there and if they're realizing, oh, okay, that it's it's not really that easy, you know. But then uh, between Canada and the rest of the world, it's exactly the same gap, or, or if not bigger. And, you know, so our players who are the best in the country, you know, we, uh, we I always say, you know, we generate every year 
25 national champions at the junior level and uh, 25 at the cadet level and 25 or 30 at the younger level so you you are you are talking about um, plus senior competition plus masters competition we are talking about hundreds of people who are champions national champions every year and then uh, we have one performer at the world stage per decade so you are you are looking at the, you know the reversal of of the picture is uh, is dramatic you know so regardless the stage of judo today in in canada is better than we than we had if not ever it it, it is definitely in the in the past 40 50 years last question what advice do do you give uh would you give to any uh any of your students any any current judoka or, or so on and so forth when it comes to to training and and committing themselves to training what what advice uh oh do it as for as long as you love it once you lose lose the passion and and love for judo uh then uh you're wasting your time. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to Conversations with Garmami. For more information, visit garmami.com. That's G-A-R-M-A-M-I-E dot com. G-A-R-M-A-M-I-E dot com.